Hailing from Sweden, Shalkin Messiah would make the way to the promised land of LA in the Sunset Strip. But even in the heart of LA, they were able to carve out their own unique sound, which helped them to stick out, especially at a time when most glam bands were a dime a dozen. Being founded by friends Harry Cody and Tim Skull, the two had a drive to succeed and were the creative force behind Shalkin Messiah. They would become an underground sensation specifically after their 1991 album Second Coming, before moving on to other avenues musically. So without further ado, let's get right into Shotgun Messiah. Shotgun Messiah's self-titled debut was actually released twice. The first time in Sweden when they were going by the name Kingpin, and the album was called Welcome to Bob City. They also had a colorful, glitzy glam look, looking like they were in drag before they adopted the Guns N' Roses getup with the denim vest and leather jackets. After the move to LA, they changed the name and the album was re-released as Shotgun Messiah. There's a really good sleaze rock feel on here with Harry Cody's electrostatic pain and with riffs that have a groove to them and they managed to steer away from the bubblegum pop sound, which, let's be honest, was on its way out like Joe Biden's hairline as soon as G&R hit the scene. But the one thing that diminishes this album is the spazzy over-the-top vocals. They just take everything down a notch, which is a shame, because everything else is up to Paul, especially the two bangles, I'm Your Love and the Infectious Shredder, Novice. Shaka Messiah's debut hit it off right, but it seemed like something was missing, and it wasn't until their second album that things truly began to come together. Right after coming off a tour in support of their first album, the band decided to drop their single Ziggy Zane or Billy Zane or whatever the fuck his name is and told him to hit the dusty trail. We just sat down and uh, we said, okay, it, it seems like we can't work together. Uh, so. Then I said, okay. And boy, what a difference a change in vocals makes. As Tim Skull dropped the bass, he assumed the duty as single and front man. And this change could not have been any more apparent than on the band's second LP, Second Coming. Second Coming is a barrage of glam metal, punk rock, and high energy. It puts Shaka and Messiah up on top of the list of bands that seem to have fallen through the cracks and the decade of change that was the 90s. There's high beat party jams like Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll and Quasi Acid Punk Like Nobody's Home, along with possibly the highlight of the album, Heartbreak Boulevard. Even the more easy going tracks hold up, like Living Without You and Ride the Storm, which always makes me think about peacefully journeying down a desert road. There's also a New York Dolls cover Babylon, which is miles above the original. Second Coming didn't fail as well as their previous album, despite being an overall way better album. But unfortunately, it was at a time where the record companies were phasing out anyone who was in Red Hot Chili Peppers or from Seattle. If you ever hear anyone disparage the glam metal scene of the early 90s, just throw this at them and tell them to listen the fuck up because Shock and Messiah were doing it right. As the band were facing a vastly changing music industry and half of the band parting ways towards the end of 92, mainly bassist Bobby Lycon and drummer Stix Galore, who by the way didn't even play drums on Second Coming, since it was done by a drum machine, the two founded members, Harry Cody and Tim Skull, decided to regroup and do a 180, jump into an entirely different sound that was more inclusive to industrial than anything else they had done. With the duo of Skull and Cody switching gears to industrial and having a cyberpunk aesthetic to boot, it was the perfect adaptation for Shark and Messiah, and they nailed it on By the New Breed. Part of what makes Vinyl New Breed good was that it didn't come across as contrived and it was a natural transition from the band's glam days into industrial, 
mainly because of Tim Scold's wanting to move in that direction because of his admiration of bands like KMFDM, who Scold would work with later on. Violent New Breed brought a new edge to the band and will send shockwaves through your ears. Best song on there? I don't know, but I do like the song Jihad. But I can't say there was anything bad on this album. I would say a lot of these songs would fit as an old school ECW theme. They kind of have that vibe to them, especially Violent New Breed, the title track. So if you're looking for love songs and lullabies, look elsewhere, because this album is sheer fist-pumping aggression straight from the industrial underground. For the recording of Violent New Breed, the band went back to their home country of Sweden, where all the instruments were played by either Harry Cody or Tim Skull. This would be their last album, as Shark and Messiah would call it quits the same year of its release. After the band's breakup in 1993, guitarist Terry Cody would move on to other projects that never seemed to be able to get off the ground, while singer and multi-instrumentalist Tim Skull would start a solo project, releasing his first album, Skull, in 1996. He would also play in a host of other bands, most notably Melvin Madsen in the mid-2000s. There were recently talks of Tim Skold resurrecting Shark and Messiah with Harry Cody, but nothing has come of it yet. Whether we do see them play again or not, the truth remains that Shark and Messiah were an underrated period piece of the early 90s, and all three of their phases are worthy listening. That would do it for this retro doc, and until next time.